hi again everyone welcome back to the plant-based asia summit i'm angie and this afternoon we have a super super special guest joining us all the way from hawaii josh tetrick is the ceo and founder of eat just a california-based food tech company that aims to resolve the environmental and ethical concerns of mass animal agriculture with plant-based products and cultured meat Eat Just has an egg alternative called Just Egg, which is non-GMO, cholesterol-free, and made using mung beans. Eat Just also has created a revolutionary cultured or lab-grown chicken called Good Meat, which is created through a form of cellular agriculture where a piece of meat is grown in a lab and aims to change the future of animal agriculture. Now, Josh believes that by the time our young children go to university, cultured meat is just going to be called meat. Welcome, Josh. It's such an honor to have you here with us today. Great to be with you. I think I just want to start with a little bit of background information about your journey. So could you share what was the moment that you decided you were going to be part of changing and shaping the future of animal agriculture? Yeah, you know, it wasn't uh, one, wasn't one single moment, uh, Angie. It really started with my best friend, also named Josh, uh, Josh Balk, who um, introduced me to why animals uh, really matter when we were 13, 14 years old. And um, it was uh, affection for whales that got him really connected to animals. And he eventually taught me uh, how the food that we eat comes from a, another kind of animal that also deserves our our care, pigs and chickens and, and cows. Um, and then eventually, along with him, I decided to start the company over nine years ago um, in hopes that we could use a different approach, technology, not just behavior change, but technology uh, to make uh, some of the world's most conventional animal products like an egg or chicken so much better without needing to slaughter an animal, without needing to tear down a rainforest, without needing to use antibiotics or or hormones um, in a way where we can eat all the meat and we eggs uh, and eggs we want without all the issues. Yeah, you actually spent some time in Africa as well, didn't you? Um, can you tell us just a little bit of, about that? Yeah, I, uh, I went back and forth for a handful of years living in Liberia, South Africa, uh, in Kenya, and I was mostly doing nonprofit work, uh, trying to help kid, kids get off the street and into school. and some other important initiatives. And it was, uh, it was good for me to, to get outside the US and, and have a differently, uh, entirely different point of view. Uh, but while I was there, I realized that uh, uh, business capitalism is probably the most effective way to get things done. It's not that it's the only way to get things done, but it felt like the most effective way to get things done for me. And um, I had this realization that, that capitalism and all the processes underneath it can be used to harm ourselves in the world, or it can be used to heal ourselves in the world. And the difference between the two is what you want. Like, what is your intention? What is then the business model? And then what is the, you know, the end outcome? And, and I decided that capitalism to make the food system a little bit better was the, the place I wanted to put my life. That's awesome. Good for you. So let's, uh, let's touch on the actual environmental issues of animal agriculture, specifically mass animal agriculture. Could you tell us what kind of problems this creates? Yeah, I'll start with uh, imagine um, for the folks that are listening and watching this, imagine you're in an alien spaceship and you're over this little planet that we call Earth and you're trying to figure out how these human beings down there actually use this planet. Um, and you get your uh, you get your assistant to type up how the, end, and the, la the land is being used and they come back to you and they say, sir, uh, Ma'am, um, it looks like about a third of the planet down there is being used for one kind of activity. And then you say, well, what is that? And they say, well, it looks like it's to plant soy and corn for the animals this human species is eating. And then you'd probably stop and ask yourself, is this even the kind of planet you want to visit? Because people are that uh, backwards that they've decided to use a third of their planet to plant soy and corn to feed the animals we eat. And we only have one of them. Uh, so it starts with that, how we decide to use the land and the consequences of using a third of our land for this mean that instead of rainforests, we have fields of chicken feed. The consequences of this, instead of having abundant coral reefs and marine life, we have ocean runoff, uh, ocean uh, uh, waste and dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico. The consequences uh, of this are more climate change emissions comes from 
the animals we eat than all the cars, trains uh, combined. Um, so it, it, uh, it starts with the decision that we need all of these animals in the first place. Um, and then a whole lot of negative things for the environment follows from that. Exactly. So, so this must have um, then, I guess, inspired you to, to get into cultured meat. So let's talk a bit about that. <laughs> You've called it good meat. Um, which is cultured or lab-grown meat. And um, it, you claim that you don't take down a tree or kill an animal in the process. So could you please explain how, what the process is of actually creating a piece of lab-grown meat and yeah. how is it more environmentally, more ethically friendly than our current methods of animal agriculture? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with a, a typical conventional chicken or um, pig. So chicken and, and pork and beef are the most commonly consumed animal proteins. And with a chicken, you've got hundreds of thousands of chickens in warehouses, in a single warehouse, and they're eating soy and corn all day long. And that soy and corn is feeding their body the muscle and the fat. And after about 47 days, the chicken is slaughtered, chopped up, and now you're eating chicken fingers at lunch in your high school cafe without even realizing what happened. Um, what we do is give you the end thing that you want, the really good tasty chicken, whether that's a chicken breast, fried, breaded, however you want it without all the other nonsense that comes before. So we don't need to slaughter an animal, we just need a cell. We don't need all that soy and corn that causes all these rainforests to be destroyed. We just need nutrients to feed the cell. We don't need all these warehouses with hundreds of thousands and millions of animals crammed body to body or wet markets that are doing the same thing. We need a stainless steel vessel called a bioreactor, but the end product is the same. And at the end of the day, um, I think, and this is the bet my company is making that people like how chicken or beef or pork tastes. They like knowing it's chicken, beef or pork. And if the process is a bit different, they're gonna be okay with that. Uh, and it's up to us to scale it. It's up to us to make sure that it's on every, uh, every dining table, not just uh, a couple in Singapore. Yeah, like you said um, in a previous interview, which I read that, you know, our kids are gonna just know it as meat in the future, which I think is really, really fascinating. Um, looking That's forward right. to the day. Yeah, think about other things, right? I, I was listening to, between breaks and calls, I was listening to a couple songs on my phone, they were streaming. I don't listen to that and think I'm listening to streaming music. I listen to it and I think I'm listening to music. I don't get into someone's electric car and think I'm getting into an electric car. Now I think I'm getting into a car. I don't call uh, my buddy up on this phone and think I'm going to call you on a smartphone. I think I'm going to call you on a phone. Um, once the thing gets ubiquitous enough, the descriptor before it drops. And eventually that'll happen with, with cultured or cultivated meat. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, can you also just, just talk about the actual nutritional comparison of, for instance, a normal piece of, for say a breast, uh, piece of yeah. breast meat. I, I don't, I don't eat meat. So sorry. Yeah. I compared to yeah. uh, one that's lab grown. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like asking what is the nutritional difference between a chicken that has a lot of space and a chicken in a closed up environment, the same for the most part. It's the same protein, same amino acids. Um, it's the same, it's genetically, it's not trying to be the same, it just is the same. Uh, so the good stuff, it's the same, meaning the protein content, the bad stuff like saturated fat, it's the same. The bad stuff like cholesterol, it's the same. So we're not saying this is better than a bowl of lentils or kale. I'm certainly not. I still think kale and lentils are, are better for your health, uh, but it is a whole lot better than the conventional way of doing it. Totally agree. Okay, so so there are obviously some people. Uh, if we, I will say, if we if we could get everyone to eat a bowl of lentils and kale, I probably wouldn't be doing this. <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well. Okay. Some people would be saying this is an uh, this is unnatural, right? Or they might be they might be concerned this is genetically modified. And, yeah. you know, maybe wary of trying. What would you say to these people? Yeah. Well, first off, I would ask for the person that says this is unnatural. I don't want it. I would ask them to talk a little bit about what natural means to them and whether they think that the 99.9% .9 of all the meat that's consumed today is natural. Do they think 100,000 birds in a warehouse packed tightly up uh, against one another? is natural? Do they think the antibiotics uh, on their feed is natural? Do they think slaughtering them after 47 days through a process that if they saw, they probably wouldn't feel the best about 
is natural. Now, if they say that's natural, my argument doesn't really work anymore. Most people probably wouldn't say that's natural. Um, and we're using a we're using a, a different process. Uh, our cell line is entirely non-GMO. There's no genetic engineering, even though it almost sounds like there's genetic engineering in it. There's actually not substantively. So we get a cell, we identify nutrients, and then we scale it up in this stainless steel vessel. Um, but um, uh, lentils and kale is certainly more natural than either of those processes. So if you're really concerned about natural, then I'd go whip up a kale salad right now and you'll be all right. That's good advice, Josh. Good advice. <laughs> no, I want to ask this question is a personal question of mine. Um, so from my from my understanding, from my research, I understand that in order to make a piece of cultured meat, unfortunately, companies still have to use uh, what's called fetal bovine serum, which is, I guess, what you call the growth medium component. Yeah. Now, to extract this, it's extremely inhumane. And I've heard you guys are developing a plant-based alternative to this. Um, so when can we yeah. expect to see this replacing fetal bovine serum? And what can you share what it's going to be made of? Yeah. So think about uh, an animal, a chicken consuming soy and corn. And the, the nutrients, the vitamins and minerals, the, uh, the phytonutrients in the soy and corn are feeding the muscle and the fat in the chicken. You can think of that as the media in, in our world. We want exactly the same kind of thing, but without the live animal consuming it. Um, two years ago, when we applied to SFA, the regulatory body in Singapore, to get our approval, we hadn't yet figured it out. We've since figured out a way to do it without fetal bovine serum, which is totally antithetical to what we're trying to do. We shouldn't use an animal to make slaughter-free product. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So we've since figured it out. Uh, we're waiting on the regulators to give us the thumbs up to actually uh, push that out into the market. Um, and then all future production will be um, will be without uh, FBS. Can you can you actually share what it's made of? I, I know there's someone uh, in Singapore that recently made it out of um, soy, soy based foods like um, soy milk and tofu. I think it's a thing called okara, which is the pulp. Mm -hmm. If, if you think about the, 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 the nutrients that a chicken is consuming, vitamins and minerals that are coming from soy and corn, it's the same kind of deal. We're getting vitamins and minerals, uh, amino acids from plant-based sources, um, mixing them all together and seeing if they work on our, our cell line. It's not uh, um, particularly special. Um, and We'll always try different formulations and for maybe our beef cell line or our pork cell line in the future might have a different formulation of vitamins and minerals that go into it. Okay, well that um, that eases my mind a little bit as well. So thank you, Josh. Um, yeah. So let, let's talk about your other product, your other product, Just Egg. Um, yeah. we, I mean, we haven't actually had a chance to try it. It looks uh, really incredible, although I still do like scrambled tofu. Um, yeah. Where are you <laughs> so, based right now? Singapore. Oh, you got to, we, uh, we just launched at, um, oh gosh, what is the name? Um, not wild B. I should, I should totally, I should totally know the, the name of this. We just launched today. Hold on. I'm gonna wild honey. Wild honey. Okay. Wild honey, yeah. We just launched at wild honey, uh, today. Um, they make a, um, just just folded egg in a Japanese style breakfast. Um, we got a just egg omelet with some eggplant, bacon, pickles, red cabbage, and wasabi mayo on it. So that's pretty good. Wow, that sounds you really might, good. You might you might reconsider your tofu scramble after you try that. <laughs> probably, probably because it's 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 um it's created from mung beans. So for me, that's that's great. Um, uh. So I, I would definitely try it, I think. So Wild Honey, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll head over there soon, I think. So can you just talk to us a little bit about the process of how you create Just Egg? Yeah. And also, why is it, how is it better for you rather than, you know, for the environment, for the health, of course, for the chickens rather yeah. than a real, a real egg? Yeah, so we started off with this knowledge that there are hundreds of thousands of plants in this world, well over 300,000. So I think mung beans, uh, black beans, kale, arugula, we've talked about some of them, there are a whole bunch of them all around the world. And we asked ourselves, well, does one of them have the ability to make an egg? 
because you've got two trillion eggs laid every single year by birds that are not in the best conditions in a way that is not the best for the environment. And it turns out that there is one that makes a better egg than a chicken egg. Um, and it's a protein in a bean called the mung bean that's been in the food system for over 4,000 years. I didn't invent the mung bean. My team didn't genetically engineer a mung bean. It just happens to make a really good egg. So what we do is we take the mung bean, we turn it into a flour by milling, and then we take that flour and we spin it at a pretty high rate of speed so the protein separates from the fat and the fiber and the starch, so you're left with protein. And then we mix uh, a non-GMO oil, some other minor ingredients, and you pour it in a pan and you have an omelet. So we can make an egg without the chicken, and we can do it in a way that it's using 67% less saturated fat. It's entirely free of dietary cholesterol. So when you think about how do you have a breakfast that's more cardioprotective? How do you have a breakfast that is not accelerating cardiovascular disease, right? Uh, but, um, but, uh, but protecting you from cardiovascular disease. Um, from an environmental perspective, uses about 90% less land, water, uh, and carbon emissions. And from an animal perspective, you don't need to mess with the animal. You can leave the animal the hell alone and just grow mung beans. So that's why we tend to like it better. I really can't wait to try it now. Um, thanks, Josh. I, I mean, I've also heard terrible you know scary stats that if you just eat two and a half eggs a week uh, you increase your chances of catching of not catching of uh, getting pro prostate cancer i think by about 80 percent something very high like that um so this would be a great one to tell my dad about because he's you know the old, older uh -huh. generation are harder to sway their minds so uh hopefully hopefully you'll be able to try it and be changed forever. I mean, especially, you know, the far and away, the number one, the leading cause of death for men around the world is cardiovascular disease. And it's not, it, sometimes I think people overcomplicate this. So all cardiovascular disease is, is um, a plaque is caused by uh, cholesterol. Um, and cholesterol is taken in your body by cholesterol or saturated fat that is then converted um, into cholesterol. And then instead of your blood flowing smoothly through your arteries, it's blocked and then you have a heart attack. So it's, it's not, we kind of overcomplicate this stuff. It comes from what we put in our mouth for the most part. And we could just choose to put different things in our mouth, things that are protecting our arteries instead of harming our arteries. Back, back to, we have a couple more questions. Um, so let's talk about Good Meat again and its availability because you guys first launched in Singapore at the end of last year. Um, so when are we going to be able to try it um, in other countries and the rest of Asia Pacific in the near future? And what are your plans going forward? So the biggest limiting step for other countries trying it are other countries allowing the sale of it. So we're working with regulators both in Qatar and the United States to provide a pathway to sell it. Um, hard to tell when that's going to be, um, but we're getting prepared for um, eventual launches both in Qatar and the United States. Um, the most important thing we need to do is make a whole lot more of it. Even in Singapore today, it's served on a very small scale. We need to make a lot more. We need to make tens of millions of pounds. Um, and we're investing a lot of capital every day in building larger scale vessels to make a whole lot more. Your, your plans going forward, you're going to be extending into other forms of, of meat. So I think you mentioned yeah, earlier pork and... Yeah, so we'll, we'll make more. Um, we'll eventually move into beef and pork and then the seafoods. Um, pretty much all the major kinds of animal protein, whether from uh, the ocean or a lake or the land, we don't think we need meat that requires the uh, slaughter of an animal or requires all of the uh, all of the negative impacts uh, to to our planet. There's just a there's a different, better way of, of doing it. We evolve on lots of different. Right? Like I personally think streaming music is a lot more efficient to me than buying a CD. That's easier for me. I think it's sometimes easier to actually watch a movie that I download on my TV instead of going to a movie theater. Um, uh, GM 
uh, used to fight against uh, electric cars. Now they've said they're only going to be making electric cars. European automakers used to fight against electric cars. And the EU just said uh, a few days ago that it wants to uh, eliminate uh, the um, internal combustion engine uh, in the EU in the next decade. We change in response to reason and logic, right? Um, meat is just the next thing that needs to change along that along that line. Yeah, especially now with um, with climate change happening, you know, and it's unequivocally man made. It's proven now. So yeah, this will be the next step. Really excited to see how you guys take this forward and yeah. take over the world. Um, and I mean, think about it. Think about it too. We're not in person right now. You probably have visited your dad less because of this thing called COVID-19. Now let's like double click into that. What is that? What's well, called a zoonotic disease. Well, what is that? Because it sounds kind of complicated. It's a disease that comes from an animal, not a human, a non-human animal, like a duck or a, another kind of bird or a pig or a bat, you name it. Why? Because of things that we do. That could mean we stack them on top of each other in wet markets. It could mean that we disrupt um, habitats by plowing down rainforests and all of a sudden the human animal begins uh, intermingling with other kinds of animals. Um, it's because of things we do. Those things called spill, call, cause spillover effects. And we can choose to do different things that make it maybe less likely that you and I have to talk like this and we have to wear masks all day long and so many people have to lose their lives, unfortunately. And inherent in that is looking at how we're making meat. The United Nations said the number one driver of zoonotic disease is us and our meat consumption habits. And we can choose differently. Yeah, thank you, Josh. Well said. So my final question, how do you actually foresee the cultured meat market growing over the next say five to 10 years in mm. Asia Pacific, but also worldwide? Yeah, well, I think it'll, it's going to continue growing to the point where it is meat. And I think the question is not whether that happens, but, but when it happens. Um, in the next five years, I see facilities being built up across Asia Pacific and the rest of the world that are making tens of millions of pounds, not the hundreds of pounds we're making today, but tens of millions of pounds. I see restaurants moving away from conventional meat and only having cultivated or cultured meat on the menu. Um, I see young people growing up, not even um, considering that they would have meat that comes from the slaughter of an animal because they have this really good tasty meat to eat instead, or that kale and lentil salad that we talked about. Um, and uh, I think Asia Pacific, because um, you've got so many forward thinking people there, so many of the countries really believe in leaning forward with these innovative approaches um, is going to be leading the way. And, and we're, we're really excited to be a part of it. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm excited for you guys as well and to see that in the future. I, I would like to add one, one more question. Can you just share yeah. your personal journey? Um, I take it, I understand you are plant-based yourself. Um, so could you just share your journey, how, how you experienced uh, the change? Was it easy, difficult, maybe a few yeah. tips to other people? Yeah. Well, so I have a weird kind of diet. So I'm plant-based, except I do eat our chicken. So I don't know what the name for that is, but whatever that whatever that is, that's that's what I am. Um, but I, I became uh, aware of um, the problems in our food system from my, my best friend and co-founder, Josh Bach. And I I just started by um, cutting out some meats. And of course, um, I, I played uh, I played football back in the day and I had this mindset of well, of course, I can't cut away all meats because there's it's impossible to get protein just from plants. And that sounds really silly and ridiculous when I say it today, because plants, animals actually eat plants. That's how they have protein. So plants have plenty of protein. I think on a per gram basis, kale actually has more protein uh, than than beef does. So that was something I had to get over. Um, and then over the course of you know five, 10 years, I just began removing different animal products as you know, buy to butter, buy to cheese, buy to eggs, buy to beef, buy to fish. And then eventually got to the point, you know, in the last 15 years or so, where um, from a health perspective, uh, from a planet perspective, from a, the kind of human being that I want to be, um, that I'm trying to reach to perspective, 
uh, it doesn't fit with with who I am anymore. Um, and um, probably the the best tip I could I could give anyone is um, it it feels daunting to think of making such a whole wholesale change in your diet, just like everything feels daunting when you think about making any wholesale change. And begin the process by you know maybe instead of having you know uh, your you know pork sandwich uh, for for lunch have a bowl of lentils instead. Now you can still have that steak for dinner, that's fine. But just begin the process, the habit energy of eating a little bit better and see how you feel about it. And then realize that animal food can taste really nasty and plant food can taste really nasty. And it's often just a consequence of how you make it. So try to figure out, um, you know, if you like spicy food, you can make plant food spicy. And try to figure out clever and creative ways to to make it, and um, that that was helpful to uh, to me. I I want to live well past ninety. I want to you know be a great grandfather one day. I want to see what the world's going to look like uh, when I'm ninety, um, and I want to live in a world that I'm proud of. And I, I think for all those reasons, uh, eating a little bit kinder matters. Beautifully put, Josh. Uh, so step by step would be your your biggest tip, right. right? You look like you don't get enough protein at all. I have to say, like you look like you're, <laughs> you're protein deficient for sure on your plants. Protein, protein <laughs> well, that's why I used to see. That's what I used to tell Josh. Uh, Josh Balk. I said, Josh, I you know my my bones are gonna break. You know, I'm gonna I, I'm just gonna just waste away if I don't have my you know 20 chicken breasts a day. What am I gonna do? And and of course. You know, all you need to do, Google lentils, nutritional profile, one cup, and then Google chicken breast, nutritional profile, one cup and shut up and have the lentils. You'll be all right. <laughs> uh, good, good way to end it, Josh. Um, thank you. Thanks so much for your time and your insights. And uh, yeah, all the best going forward. Looking forward to trying just uh, egg here in Singapore. Enjoy the rest of your day. and. Um, yeah, look forward to hearing more from you soon. Definitely. See you soon.